Good afternoon, the Children's Theatre. How can I help you? Oh yes, good afternoon. I'm quite interested in the programmes you have on offer there. Could you give me a little more information, please? Of course. Would that be the 6 to 11 programme or the over 11s? Um, 6 to 11, actually. Okay, well, as you probably already know, the theatre sessions for that age group take place on Thursdays evenings from 6.30 to 8, and every other Sunday from 2 to 3.30. Okay, that sounds convenient. And where are the sessions held? We use the old theatre on Brook Rock Street. Do you know it? Oh, you use an actual theatre. How wonderful. No, I don't think I do know it. What was the street name again, please? It's Brookwalk. That's B R O O K W A L K. Okay, thank you. And could I ask you about the price? Yes, of course. We normally have a 12 week term, and then there's a performance at the end of each term, which coincides with the school's holidays. If you pay the full term in advance, it's 60 pounds per child. We actually do a family discount as well. So we give you a 5% discount for the second and third child, etc., etc. Okay. That's interesting, because I did want to bring my son and my younger daughter along. Oh, well, in that case, it would be £57 for each of them. Or, just a second, sorry, my math's not my strong point. £114 in total. You can pay weekly if you prefer, but it works out a bit more expensive. It's £6 per week per child. So for yourself, for two children I mean, it would be a total of 6 times 12, 72 times 2, 146... 144? Um, sorry, 144. 144 pounds. But there would also be 5% discount on each. No, sorry. That's only the option on advance payment. Okay, I see. Right. So what else do I need to know? Well, you may like to know that the next session starts next week, the 19th of September. That's leading up until the Christmas show. Um, also, your child needs to be here 10 minutes beforehand so I can check attendance and still start on time. Can parents come in and watch? Well, that's a good question. Of course, many parents would like to, mainly through a concern for their child's well-being, but the problem we found is that many of the children are more inhibited when their parents are watching. So quite honestly, they don't develop as well as we would like them to. Oh, I see. So we're not allowed in. Well, what we decided a few years ago, and it seems to have worked very well, is to allow parents in during the first 30 minutes of the first session. Also, at the end of the first session, I and my colleagues stay here later to answer any concerns you may have. Okay, I see. Also, we invite you back on the middle Sunday to see how everything is going. I see. That sounds great. And then, of course, you are invited to the show at the end of the term. Okay, very good. Um, just a few more questions. One of the reasons for getting the children involved in a theatre group was for the educational side of things. Um, what do you think they get out of it exactly? Well, again, a very good question. Of course, what children take away is different for each child, but on a whole, we believe it's extremely beneficial in several important areas of life. Perhaps the most important one is the social skills children developed. I mean not only during the play itself, but also by having to work with other children to get a good result. So they're starting to learn how to negotiate? Oh, indeed. They are, and this actually helps them to gain much more confidence in themselves and usually communicate far better. Right, right. Also, we make sure that there is a reasonable level of analysis of the play. I mean, in order for children to act well, they need to be pretty good at understanding the story and the role each character is playing. In order to portray a character well, they need to understand all aspects of the play. This often stretches them mentally and gives them insight into the world outside of their classrooms at the same time. Right, I understand. The other thing perhaps I should mention is that children have to learn and understand their lines, of course. So again, there's that academic side to it, 
And finally, we shouldn't forget that they thoroughly enjoy themselves. That's true. Well, look, thanks very much. I look forward to meeting you on... Well, first, uh, good morning to you all, and once again, welcome to the university. Um, as you know, I'm going to run through the library system we have here and cover most of what you need to know to use the libraries on campus. Um, we'll then have time at the end for any questions you may have. So I'll begin with what you need to get started. I'll then move on to how to actually use the library, and we'll finish by providing some information about how you can communicate with us in the future. So, uh, first of all, what you need to get started. There are two things, your university ID card and secondly, your library account. Now, most of you should already have your university ID card, but for those of you who haven't, please go to the Student Service Centre as soon as you can and uh, please remember you'll need three passport size photos as well as your acceptance letter. Okay, now as soon as you get your university ID card you can sign up for your library account. I'll just run through how to do this. First of all go to the university website. You don't need to sign in at this point. In the top right hand corner you'll see a link to the library website. Click on that and that will take you to the library website. At the top of that page, you'll see a tab labelled New Students. If you click on that, you'll see a drop-down menu which contains an option called Using the Library. Select that option. Again, at the top of that page, you'll see a large blue button which says Create New Account. So just click on that one and you'll be asked to enter your details including your university ID number which you can find of course at the top of your ID card and that's why you need to get your ID card first. Yeah. Okay. After you've filled in the online form um, you'll get your PIN number sent to your university email address so you can then log into your library account. Once inside you can change your PIN number if you like. Now you can also do quite a lot from, from this point of the website, uh, from your library account page. When you start borrowing from the library, for example, you can check when your books need to be returned, and uh, we'll turn to that in a moment. You can also renew your loans if uh, they're not being requested by other students, and you can request a book from inside your account as well. Um, you will then receive updates about when the publication will be available for you. So, let's turn to actually using the library, going inside, uh, finding what you're looking for and the procedure for borrowing. Um, if you've walked past the entrance of any of the university libraries, you'll probably have noticed that there are several turnstiles. Um, as you walk through a turnstile, you need just to touch the screen on your right uh, with your ID card uh, face down. Uh, they're a little sensitive, but you don't need to place your card down on the screen or to hit the screen too hard with the card. Just a light touch is usually all that's required. Okay, so where to go once you're inside? So, after the turnstiles, you'll notice about 10 computers on both your left and right hand side. Go to any one of these computers and on the screen you'll see a page showing search options. You can search the whole library database by title of the publication, by author, by category um, and by several other fields. When you find what you're looking for, you'll see in the end column um, a location reference. The first letter gives you the zone, the next number gives you the floor, and then the remaining numbers um, will give you the shelf location. The best thing to do is to go to the library as soon as you can 
um, and just try to find three or four publications. You'll soon understand how, how things are organised. Okay, one more thing I need to quickly mention is that um, if you're having problems finding a publication on the computer, you can go to the reception desk and the staff there will be happy to help you. Of course, please don't overuse this service. The staff are very busy, so please try as many options as you can to find the publication on the computer first. You should go to reception only as a last resort. In terms of borrowing publications, you can take out up to 20 books at any one time. Loan periods vary depending on the book and whether or not it's being requested by other students. The usual loan period is four weeks, but you will be told the return date when you take out a book. And as I mentioned earlier, you can check to see that date has changed or not by checking into your library account. If the return date does change, however, you'll receive an email informing you of that. Please also note that the fines are charged on all books returned late. So please be careful. These charges are applied on a daily, not on a weekly basis. If you find the loan period is not long enough and you need to renew your loan, you can do so in one of three ways. You can simply bring the book back to the library and renew it at the counter or you can request an extension to the loan period from inside your account or you can phone uh, the telephone renewal service this is an automated system open 24 hours you simply have to enter your account details and then the books ISBN number okay uh, just a word or two on keeping the library a pleasant place to study um, just a few things to bear in mind firstly please respect the various zones inside the library. For example, keep your group discussions to the group discussion zone and respect the silent st study zones. Also, take social chat outside the library or to the relaxation area where you can also get uh, refreshments. Please be tidy. In terms of your belongings, don't take up workstations or chairs uh, with your bags during busy periods. Also, please be careful not to have cables and wires trailing. Uh, these could cause hazards. Regarding rubbish, please help the staff to keep the library clean and tidy. I think it goes without saying that your mobile should be on silent mode. And uh, finally, please show the same respect and courtesy uh, to the staff as they show to you. OK. Finally, those contact numbers and email addresses I promised you. So tell me again, Jack, what do the course tutors want us to come up with in this report? Well, they want our reflections on the course last year and suggestions for areas of improvement. I mean, one specific question they asked was whether or not we think enough weighting was given to the research component. I see. So how we felt about last year's course and how we feel it can be improved. Yes. Now I think most of us enjoyed the course, but the biggest problem for me really, with all the modules, was the practical side of things. You mean how it all works in practice? Yes. I mean, some examples of real world situations would have helped me to make more sense of it, I think. I agree. Definitely. So we're going to make a list then. I can do that. OK, great. So the first one is more real-world examples. OK, got it. What about the number of words for each assignment? I thought it was too high at 4,500. Wouldn't 3,000 be better? That's a good point. They were pretty hard to finish. I think the tutors may think 3,000 is too short, though. Shall we come back to that point? I think perhaps we should focus first on more general things. Yeah, you're probably right. The other thing I wasn't completely okay with was the module on culture. I mean, I know that culture is important and it's essential to have an understanding of the role it plays, but I'm not really sure it deserves such a high weighting. I mean, it's one and a half times some of the core topics. That can't be right, can it? Yes, I was thinking about that. I thought we went into far too much steps as well. It was really hard for me to see how it related, like you said before, on a practical level. Right. So, less time devoted to the cultural aspect of things then. Okay. 
What about the assessment criteria? What do you mean? Well, I think it would be better if the practical assignments contributed more to the final score. So, list marks for the final year exam? Yes, I think the balance isn't quite right. I mean, when all is said and done, we're preparing for jobs in the outside world, not jobs in academia. I think you've got a good point there. So, what would you suggest? I think 50-50. So, 10% less for the exam and 10% more for the practical work. That does sound better. Okay, I'll put that one down. The other thing I was thinking about, I'm not sure how this will go down with the tutors, but I was thinking about the balance of tuition formats. I mean, I think quite a lot more could be made available online, and personally, I would prefer more group tutorials than lectures. Well, I hadn't thought about that, but now you mention it, perhaps that could be improved. Basically, more contact time with the tutors in small groups. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So you think we should list some of the advantages of a different combination of tuition formats? Yes, I think so. Then the tutors can see why we think it would be a good idea. So you said perhaps 20% fewer lectures and a lot more reading posted online, right? Yes. And then 20% more small group tutorials where we can discuss the reading in more detail and talk more about the key issues? Yes, I think so. I mean, the first advantage of that would be that we would get more face time with the tutors but their contact time with us wouldn't increase. So, it's not like we're asking them to spend more time with us than they do now. Right. What would be another advantage? Well, another advantage could be that they wouldn't need to spend as much time with us during individual tutorials because a lot of our questions would get answered in the group sessions. That's a good point. So we could all save time there. Yes. If a lot more of the reading was posted online, we could organise our time better. We could do the required reading at a time that suits us best, and I'm sure that would be better for everyone. Right. I'm just wondering whether the tutors are going to ask us if these ideas are popular with all last year students, or if they're just our ideas. Um, I mean, do you think we need some statistics to back up the suggestions? That would be good, but how can we do that? Well, how about posting a questionnaire to people and asking them to fill it in and send it back to us. That's going to take quite a long time. What if we could just email everyone with a link to a web page and they could vote on the page if they're in favour or not? Excellent. Do you know how to do that? Yes, no problem. Okay then. That should make it really interesting report. There is now one more challenge facing the education authorities. A recent initiative, and one which many experts believed would give new life to secondary schools, was set up only 18 months ago. It allowed teachers, one, time off from their regular job, two, a salary while training, and three, a private coach to help them through their instruction. So, there was no shortage of applicants, right? Well, wrong, it seems. In fact, the number of applicants for the scheme has dropped dramatically since an early flurry of interest in the first two months. So, what exactly is the scheme aimed at doing, and why is it seemingly not doing so well? The scheme named Headway was established to encourage teachers who showed promise in managerial or leadership situations to spend one year on a fairly intensive training program to become head teachers. These super heads, as they were referred to when the program was launched, would then go on to work in a secondary school in one of the poorest regions of the country, ensure disadvantaged children received the education they needed for a better life, and transform the schools into glowing examples which other schools could then follow. The problem the scheme is trying to address is this. 
Until about ten years ago, secondary schools seemed to have sufficient heads. Many of these heads, however, were reaching retirement age, and many have now retired. In addition, there was a considerable lack of interest in these positions due to relatively low salaries and high demands. The pain simply wasn't worth the gain. As conditions, particularly in the poorer areas, has sadly deteriorated further in the last decade. So, the interest in these jobs from talented people has decreased. Two years ago, the situation was thought to be so serious that if action was not taken soon, some secondary schools, and again notably those in the poorest areas, would be faced with the reality of having no head teacher. The government's answer? Headway. Just over £3 million has been ploughed into Headway since its commencement. It was felt that the scheme would produce over 100 superheads annually. Sufficient to plug the gap in the short term and sufficient to meet future demand in the long term. It was also felt that one of the main contributing factors to the lack of interest previously seen was the absence of high-quality, full-time training and support. So, under headway, teachers who joined the scheme would firstly be allowed to quit their jobs so that they had all the time they needed to concentrate on the training. Secondly, they would continue to receive 80% of their previous salary. And in addition, a private coach would be assigned to them to provide support and advice on tricky issues. On successful completion of the program, the teachers would then be given assistance in finding a position which suited them in one of the secondary schools in a poor region. A position which, these days, comes with a six-figure salary and perks. It's not surprising, therefore, that the Department of Education spokesman was visibly excited by the scheme uh, at its release, and that most observers felt that uh, there was room for genuine optimism. What more could aspiring head teachers want? Surely headway was indeed the way forward. Well, apparently not. So what's going wrong? At the start of the scheme, approximately 120 teachers applied monthly. Last month, that figure was under 50. These numbers are the number of applicants, not the number of successful applicants. Those teachers who are accepted on headway make up about 9% of the total. Add to this a dropout rate of about 20% and a pass rate of about 60%, and you can start to see that the numbers previously forecast are unlikely to be met. And you can also see that the scheme is in real trouble. The relatively low pass rate in the first year could be partly responsible for the drop-off in applicants. Some people may simply have been put off. But there are other factors at play. About one year ago, the General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders said teachers had been discouraged from the scheme by suggestions from the Minister of Education that schools could save money on senior staff if they merged. The idea, it seems, was that a head teacher and a team of deputy heads would work across a number of different schools. This would mean fewer head teacher positions, of course, and fewer options for teachers after they completed the scheme. Another factor are the concerns of some governors that the fast-track headway scheme is simply too fast. Many of these people question whether even the brightest and most promising head teachers can acquire the level they require in one year. The feeling is that the intensive nature of the scheme is not the best model. 
trainee heads need more time on the job to be effective and to make the right decisions. These feelings may have filtered down to the teachers considering the scheme. If they feel that the scheme will not actually prepare them sufficiently well for the challenging task ahead, they are unlikely to sign up. They may also be unlikely to sign up since the scheme is not actually compulsory. Headway is supposed to be the fast track to a head teacher position, but it is not the only route. A teacher could still work their way up over a period of several years, take a deputy head position for a while, and then apply for the top job. This may be a more comfortable route for many. They can learn on the job and perhaps feel they are, at the end of the day, better equipped than if they'd gone through headway.